everybody, this is Townsend. Thank you so much for tuning in. As a lot of you know, these conversations began as joined live streams that turned into podcasts to help reach more people and spread more hope. Thank you so much for your patience with the quality of sound as we figure out the best way to bring you these important chats, just in hopes of spreading more love and positivity. I hope you enjoy. Going back to where we were, Kane is a physical therapist. He works in the geriatric setting or what we call a sniff setting, which is like rehab, long-term care, older adults. Uh, Megan works as a nurse practitioner in a women's care clinic. So I wanted to chat with them. Like I said, they're super involved with friends, family, church, community, things like that. So I thought they were perfect going through this phase of a global pandemic and balancing all the stress that's coming with that and then going home and being the parents to two small kids, a dog, family, all of these things going on. So it's almost like y'all are juggling a circus all the time. So <laughs> I'm super way. impressed to say for one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can only imagine. Somebody says, we love you, Kane. Uh, I can't tell who that is. Oh, wow. Thank you. I, <laughs> all right. That there makes, you go. That makes right. like five people, so I'll take it. <laughs> Hey, they <laughs> two of them you're talking to right now. Exactly. Okay, so let's get started. <laughs> Since we got everybody kind of off track. All right, let's say what's one thing that you would want people that don't work in these settings to know? So maybe something that they can't see unless they're in the middle of it, right? So we work in healthcare, we see this every single day. What's something that y'all would say you would want people to know about or that they don't see? I, I would say I think it's just the the daily grind, just going in. I mean, we're going on a year of this stuff and just what people in healthcare setting are going through is unlike anything we've ever done before. Uh, it's totally new. Um, we're figuring out kind of like technology while we're streaming this. Trying to figure <laughs> yeah. out. We're trying to figure it out as we go. Policies change. Uh, you know, you show up to work in the morning, an hour later, they say, hey, what we told you, scrap that, we're going to do this again. I mean, it's just, it's constantly evolving, constantly changing, um, kind of flying by the seat of the pants, which to me only makes it that much more stressful. I'm, I'm a planner. I like to know what's going on, uh, have my schedule for the day. And when you just throw something new all the time, it just kind of stresses me out. So I think just kind of the, the constant shift, the constant change that's going on is, um, it's just, it's, it makes it hard to do your job. And then it, it also makes juggling everything else outside of your job, like your kids or your family or church or everything like that. It's uh, it makes that hard as well because work is so, uh, changing and, and inconsistent that it makes everything else hard to be consistent as well. So that, that would, be what I would say. What do you think, though? Yeah, totally. Yeah, agree. for sure. Megan, what about you? Like in the women's clinic? Yeah. Um, and P.S. I wanted to preface by saying that I don't really feel. Um, you know, I'm working in a women's health clinic, so I haven't worked directly with any positive COVID patients. So I feel like I'm speaking yeah. on behalf of people who are both in healthcare, not working with COVID patients directly. Plus, you know, I've got so many people who are directly working with those patients. So um, I don't pretend that my job is as intense as that is, you know, but I'm speaking on behalf of all of us. So um, anyway, just had to say that, but as long yeah. as, um, hey, you get to deal with his bad attitudes though, when he comes yeah. home. So <laughs> you get to hear about it. So that counts enough in my book. <laughs> um, but yeah, certainly. But I mean, do you feel like things have changed? Um, as far as like policies and all of that, yeah, just something people that don't work in healthcare in general, something you would want them to know about that maybe they don't know because they're not there. Sure. Um, I think for me, it's the weight of not just putting ourselves or our families at risk, but it's, I've been so scared this entire time until I got vaccinated. Who could I possibly spread this to if yeah. I get it? Um and that's just been terrifying for me. Um, it's yeah. just a really heavy weight to bear um, because everything that we do is for not just the patient, but for their family and our communities as a whole. Um, and so it just is this heavy, heavy, heavy weight um, in addition to the job that you're already doing, in addition to, you know, trying to keep your spouse, your family, your children, um, all of them safe too. So it's just, um, it's been a heavy weight for a year now. Yeah. But, um, 
like I said, we've both been vaccinated now. And so um, we feel much safer. Um, so we're very thankful for that. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like my biggest thing for where Kane and I are, so we both work in geriatrics, so pretty much hands on with the COVID stuff. I feel like the biggest thing for me that people don't see is the struggle altogether. So not only your work, afraid of getting germs to take home to your family, but you're afraid of taking germs to a vulnerable population. And then not only that, you're worried about gowning up correctly and not doing it incorrectly because then it's your fault that they get it. And just like Kane said, every day the rules change. So we'll be in a room with a gown and a mask and they come down and say later, oh no, yeah, you have to have 10 more layers on than what you right. did. And you're just like, oh my gosh. Right. And it's been over a year that's happening. And then you don't just leave it at work. You come home. And uh, for me personally, I think Kane does this as well. And you too, Megan. But I have a station set up at my back door. And so when I get home, I instantly change my scrubs, uh, like spray my shoes off, take right. a shower. And it's just so exhausting because that's been going on for over an hour, over a year. Oh, yeah. Know? Yeah, we get the same I thing. I feel like, yeah, I feel like that's my thing with people just don't see it. You know, you can talk about it all you want, but until you have to gown up for eight hours, you know, nothing rubs me the wrong way more than what somebody like gripes about those cloth masks. <laughs> I had to wear it to go into a restaurant. Right. I'm like, fool, wear an N95 with something over it, plus a face shield, plus goggles for nine hours, and then gripe to me about plus it. Plus <laughs> yelling to people who can't see or hear you oh. to begin with. <laughs> And then you come home oh, and you man. wonder, my five-year-old's like, why do I not want to talk? And like, because I physically yeah. can't talk. Anymore. Because I'm tired. You like, yeah. don't know how to stop yelling. Yeah. What's yeah, crazy is uh, our son, he, he started when he comes home, we have a little trash can set up. Our scrubs go in there, spray the shoes. They sit on a uh, step ladder. He takes his shoes and just out of the blue, he started taking the shoes off, spray, oh. like dousing them everywhere. Yeah. And I was like, hey man, Clorox is like, kind of a commodity right now that's not like what that's <laughs> uh, like a hundred dollars yeah, it's so yeah. funny to see how they pick up on little things like that new part of his life you know mm -hmm. so uh well, yeah. here we yeah. are thinking oh this is all extra stuff he's just like oh i just gotta spray my shoes what you know? is yeah. right. why don't you have a mask right. on you weirdo right. yeah i'll never yeah. forget the first day or two um that we had to go in they made us scan up put all this stuff on and i literally thought I was going to pass out. Mm -hmm. Like I was standing in a room drenched in sweat. My face yeah. shield was dripping, but I mean, they're also geriatrics. So the rooms are approximately 300 degrees. Sure. Um, so I'm, summer, just, I'm drenched. I'm, yeah. In the summertime, <laughs> I'm screaming at this patient. I'm like, Oh God, I'm getting lightheaded. Yeah. And it just, people don't see that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's my biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, well, I can't tell you how many days Kane's come home and he said, I didn't eat today. I didn't drink today. I didn't go to the bathroom today. Yeah. He doesn't want to tell these people because yeah. you're scared of, am I going to do something wrong? Or, you know, it's just yeah. easier to just leave it on. What do you feel like, kind of going from that, what do you feel like the biggest struggle with your job has been with COVID? So not family related, but all job related. What do you feel like the biggest struggle has been in the last year? I know, I know for us, uh, can't speak about you guys as much, but I know for us, it's the company I work for. We, we staff several different nursing homes so we can go to, to different ones. I'm not just stuck at one. I, I can work at any of them. So the biggest struggle for us has been, oh, so-and-so got sick today. So that's a therapist down for two weeks. So now we've got to absorb that load. And I think just having to it, it, it's like a family aspect you know you're all in this together so mm -hmm. everybody's doing the same thing they're putting themselves at the same risk and knowing that when most people get sick because they have i'm i think you and i are one of the few i know in my setting yeah i'm one of the few ones that i know of that hasn't gotten it. i can think of a handful but um in your family, you're the only one. <laughs> yeah, or we're the only two out of our my whole immediate family. But uh, so just I think the biggest struggle being, you know, when one of your therapist coworkers goes down now, OK, we are already thin line anyway about who shrinks up. People and then that that brings in a whole new aspect of, OK, I'm already trying to keep my people in nursing home safe, mm -hmm. plus the other two that I 
frequent a lot. So now let's add a whole new building, a whole new set of policies and procedures because every building does it differently. Remember how to do all these things. What am I supposed to bring? What am I supposed to do? Plus, how are we going to take care of all those people as well? Knowing that you're just widening your circle of people you're trying not yeah. to or not get sick. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not just the four of us here at our house. It's the 80 something people at our home, the 70 yeah. something at this one, the mm -hmm. 160 at this other one, you know, so just, I think that's been the biggest struggle uh, for me and my job. Yeah. What about you, Megan? Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think, mean, yeah. I mean, so much of what Kane said is, is true for my setting as well. Um, but I think one thing that's really hard for us is just the continual change in policies and procedures and how we're doing things. Um, you know, everything that we do is, is for the patient and we're just trying to protect everyone, the masses, of course. Um, and we do some things that frustrate people. Um, for example, so I work in women's health. So we have a lot of OB patients that um, we see. Um, and for a while, we weren't allowing anybody to come to those appointments with the patient. Um, and that's devastating. You know, we've had children, so we, we get that. You know, we both want to be at those appointments. And, you know, for a while, we weren't allowing anybody to come, even ultrasound. Of course, you want to just say, okay, you know, we'll just make an exception here or there, or um, just come on in, you know, just kind of not abide by those rules, so to speak. But then you've got to realize that we're trying to protect yeah. everybody. Um, and so it's just really hard not yeah. to um, just... I guess just lower your um, standards a little bit. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. Well, just kind of, it's hard to be loving but stern at the same time. Like, I want, I, I understand, I want you to be able to do this. It's kind of like us and families visiting. Nothing right. is more heartbreaking than seeing someone quite literally on their deathbed, hard of hearing. They don't understand technology that well. We barely understand how to get these going live streams. Right. And they've got to talk to their family outside of a window in the freezing cold or the rain through a cell phone and they don't understand it and they can't hear. And I mean, it's just, it's devastating to watch. So I know for mm -hmm. me, I want to be like, let's just open the window. Sure. Let's just yeah. take you to the door, right. Right. things like that. I mean, it's hard because you want to be loving, but at the same time, you got to remember we're protecting everybody, everybody. Right. for sure. Right. It, it's, it's been wild. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I feel like I we will kind of get to this later, but the biggest struggle, I feel like I kind of touched on that earlier. I think it's the, all the things that people don't see, they're like, Oh, bless you for being in healthcare. And I was like, I'm like, you don't even know. You don't even know. Like people see us as heroes, which we, I mean, speaking for myself do not see myself as that at all like i feel like all of that should go to the nurses and the staff things like that like they are right. called to do that that's amazing yeah. right. i by no means think i'm some blessing to people um but it is hard work hard sure. work and i think people should be a little more aware of kind of what's going on when they get impatient about not being able to go in to see a ultrasound or like mm -hmm. our patients families getting mad they can't come visit mm -hmm. it's not our call it's devastating and we wish we could bend the rules but that's just kind of not how it works you know right. right so yeah i would say that's definitely been hard for sure mm -hmm. i'm trying to think you know you were kane you were talking about policies and procedures i was trying to think of more because i know there have been more that were just like what is happening like mm -hmm. that just make the job a little bit harder but none are, of course, none are coming to mind right now. Tonight, I'll probably call you and be like, I remember 27 of them right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, for um, me, I mean, yeah. for me, the, it, it's going to all the different homes because every home has a different yeah. check-in process. And mm -hmm. some people will let these things go by or, you know, we were getting swabbed there, brain stabbed like twice a week, you know, <laughs> um, and it was like, oh, I forgot my yeah. sheet. And, it, you know, just different, yeah. different things like that. It's like you said, it, it, to me, it's just the traveling between all the different ones. If you, if you could just go to one and I'm familiar with one, I know the people at one, but then when you yeah. start going to a bunch, different ones, everybody does things different. And these people like their PPE put on and stored. Yeah. The Tra rules are different, one, right? right? Exactly. And then other people, um, the other people do it this way and it's trying to remember so that you don't, be the one guy that came in and did something and then boom a home blows up because you brought it in or yeah. did something wrong you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so as antoinette she said kane love you she also said megan that you're precious 
Uh, but she said, yes, yeah, saving COVID till last. So like traveling from building to building, building, trying to have them to plan, oh wait, this building has positive. So I got to go there last. Oh no, wait, but I have to have my sheet, but I got to get tested. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a good one to point out. So planning your day, there's just so much more thought and effort mm -hmm. put into it. And then again, like I said, it doesn't turn off when you clock out because mm -hmm. you got to go home and then be like, oh gosh, well, my car's dirty. Yes. Oh, my doorknob's dirty. Yes. I mean, yes. I went through that like obsession for a while because yeah. we didn't even know what it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we didn't know if it was mail. You remember for a while I thought it was mail. Wiping so we'd mail. spray the letters on. Yeah. Oh, Dude, buckle, buckled into my passenger seat for the last year has been <laughs> two can of Lysol wipes and yes. sanitizer, like buckled into the thing because I got tired of <laughs> driving and picking it up off the floor. So yeah. I was like, no, nah, this is how my co-pilot yeah. is Lysol and in spray right. and wipe form. Yeah. So, well, and two, hashtag like, healthcare. That's right. We have two kids that are putting everything into their mouths who aren't vaccinated. You know, we're yeah. so ready for that to happen. But I mean, so anytime we go anywhere or do anything, we're just watching them just touch everything oh, and then God. their hands go in their mouth. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's yeah. not proper. Like, like, this guy sneezed. Yeah. Oh, man. Or taking a yeah. public toilet. I never realized how nasty Oh, gosh. The restroom. <laughs> well, this was even pre COVID. Yeah. But take a two year old. Yeah. <laughs> take a two year old into a restaurant bathroom and tell me you want to go back yeah. and eat because you don't. Right. Yeah. So yeah. now at COVID, when he, he'll be like, Dad, I have to go poop. And I'm like, But do you? I don't, I don't <laughs> but I don't think Let's you do. Let's consider yeah. this. I said, I've many What's times not? I said, Can you hold it till we go home? Because it's like, so many more things now come into play of yeah. literally you can't touch oh, anything yeah. you, we back into the door so we don't have to touch it you know yeah. it's just it's crazy absolutely yeah I think something that just popped into my mind thinking about that I think a big struggle I have as well is a lot of our patients they're in a nursing home they're by themselves they're isolated and they want to hold your hand they want to hug yeah. you they want to I know for me I don't know why but they want to rub my hair it's weird well but it's feathered and like, lethal look at it yeah it's feathered be? and lethal yeah. since I cut it they think I'm the best guy at work I don't understand but <laughs> they, but they want to touch you they they want they long for that lovingness of family and you are it but then we've got our work job being like don't do that and for me, that's super upsetting because I know, Kane, we've got one male um, patient that we've seen forever. And all he wants to do is hold my hand yeah. or pat Kane and them on the back or, you know, and you just I find myself like jumping back when they reach for me. And that's so sad. Like, yeah. it just I don't know. Or they want to hug. And I'm like, I just took my gown off to leave your room. I can't come back. It, it's right. just it's really depressing to watch. Yeah. Right. That's a huge but, part of my job. Like I, I'm a very touchy feely person. I love yeah. people. I love touching people. Um, and so that's been really hard, especially in some sort of an instance where like I'm delivering bad news or talking to them around like, really difficult not. situations, you know, and I just yeah. kind of have to wave or, you know, it's, yeah. that's yeah. really hard. Man. I didn't even think about that. Like delivering bad news. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So what do you feel like since all this happened, what do you feel like is the biggest positive that's come from uh, the pandemic and the biggest negative that's come from it in healthcare? So like what's something that's just like been positive to happen to Megan, your facility, Kane, your job and something negative? You go first. Sure. Okay. Um, I think the biggest positive for me anyway, and I think a lot of people could agree with this, is that you're really seeing where your strengths and weaknesses are, um, both as somebody who's in healthcare as an institution. Um, you can see a bunch of areas where, like I said, you're weak and there's an opportunity for growth um, and then places where you're really strong. Um, and so that's been a big positive. Um, Plus, I think there's just been such this a sense of um, like camaraderie almost between healthcare um, yeah. in different settings, different healthcare providers, different um, all sorts of different people, um, and I think that's been really neat because um, we all understand what everybody else is going through and we get it and we respect each other for doing it. And um, so, yeah, I've, that's been a big positive. I think negative. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest one is there's been a big paradigm shift from when all this started. And I feel like everybody was talking about people who worked in healthcare as heroes. I mean, I remember seeing all these different posts and signs and everything about 
healthcare workers are just amazing. And, um, and then everything got so political and I'm definitely not going to go, yeah. I'm not going to get into that. Yeah, let's not, that. that could um, go all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but especially, you know, surrounding the election, there was, it was just, yeah. and people or um, even their primary care provider or you know us and um, that was really disheartening um, just because we feel like yeah. obviously we're in healthcare for a reason you know we were called to this field we um, everyone trusts us with their healthcare all the other days of the week you know why not now um, and so that's been really hard yeah. for me is to just to feel like when people come to me for advice, there's just this little bit of hesitation. Um, and, you know, I just, yeah. I wish that everybody would recognize that as healthcare providers and healthcare workers, we're, we're doing everything that we can in the best interest of our patients and their families and communities and, and everybody. And um, so that's been the big, biggest negative for me, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I, that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think kind of dovetailing on that one would be, I agree, there's just like a, it's such a polarizing thing and what used to be, you know, flu shots. I mean, there's a, a few people who are this way, that way about a flu shot. Now it's just, it's such a divisive topic now when it, it's, it's just healthcare, you know, it's not, like you said, I think it just got wrapped on the political climate and it's just one of these things where, I guess to me, the biggest negative is finding reputable sources for things like mm -hmm. whatever Gosh, Facebook yeah. live said, but my doctor said this, it's like, well, I mean, you know, it, it, people just seeing stuff go all over the place and getting stuff from anywhere, but what would be a known reputable trusted source. But mm -hmm. then even those known reputable trusted sources are now called into question because of other agendas or political motives. So I think that's the biggest negative thing yeah. with me is just mm -hmm. frustrating to see that. But um, positively speaking, I think people, I mean, are talking about healthcare. They're, they're having maybe not healthy discuss discussions, but uh, <laughs> health, healthy discussions about healthcare and uh, hygiene. Everyone's hygiene has mm -hmm. been yeah. much better in general. Like my, yeah. like, I'm speaking with my kiddo, like he just washes his hands after everything. I mean, he didn't used to do that all the time, you know? So, um, so I think just people talking about healthcare, getting that in a conversation is good, but double-edged sword, it brings into, like I was saying earlier, you get some bad sources where you get some different things and it seems to get outside the healthcare realm and into other realms like political or other things other things so oh yeah uh, but I've, I've definitely seen a lot of a lot of positives come through it kind of like mm -hmm. you said people coming together uh like you mentioned earlier towns and i wouldn't consider what we do to the people hero heroes mm -hmm. like to me those people are the the therapists i know they're working at calling regional covid unit you know yeah. texted them yeah. and checking on them and this yeah the stories i've heard from my good friend there just blow my mind about and she just you know will just kind of unload on me and tell me what's going on. And I'm just like, dude, that, you know, those are the people yeah. that in the mm -hmm. COVID units that are ones that are, that are walking the walk, you know? So, uh, to me, yeah. my hat's off to them because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are really, do. yeah, we, we, we get some of it, but nothing like they do. So I, I think yeah. everybody coming together and realizing we're all in this fight together for mm -hmm. the patients, then it, it, get, it brings a good sense of family. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's good. I think for me, the positive, I'm going to go on the clean aspect. So in our setting, like the sniff setting. So again, that's like a rehab or nursing home. They talk about UTIs or urinary tract infections have gone down like incredible percentage wise. I, I don't know exactly. And saying like 80%. And so that's just from people washing their hands and being way more clean. And so I feel like that's a positive right. people are paying more attention to what they do and their respect for people's spaces, like not sneezing on top of somebody at the store, which always drove me nuts. But um, I, I also think a positive from it, for me personally, I feel like I'll take things less for granted now since all of this happened. Cause even like we talked about earlier, even hugging a patient yeah. or hugging my parents, you know, I mean, we've not touched family members in a year especially with our job because we come home and we don't know if we're dirty or blah, 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 blah. And there's just such a stressor on 
don't get anybody sick or it's your fault. And there's like such a guilt trip there. And so, I mean, I've seen my, my parents through a window for a year, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I feel like not taking things for granted, not taking dinner with friends for granted. I feel like that's a positive. It's a negative right now, but in the end game, I feel like it will be a positive. And then I feel like a negative. Um, I don't know. I feel like there's going to be a huge shift in like gatherings, you know, even at nursing homes or like, you're always going to be afraid to be too close to somebody, you know, especially strangers. So there's almost like a shift that's going to happen, but I don't know. I'm not sure where it'll go, but there's definitely going to be some big changes happening. I don't know that we'll ever get out of wearing masks in healthcare. And that's definitely a negative. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. I was the same. I was thinking the same way just for where we work in the vulnerable population. Like you, you work with what's not defined as vulnerable for this pandemic. Not as vulnerable, but but yeah, they're, they're probably yeah, pretty they healthy, are, yeah, for sure. some of them. But for, mm-hmm. Right. For us, I feel like we, yeah, we may never get away from the mask and, a two week precautionary isolation. Anybody that comes in from the hospital has to be in their room for two weeks, 14 days, mm-hmm. just to make sure they don't have it. Like that may be a thing forever, which is really hard to give somebody therapy yeah. in their room, but just for them yeah. to know, mm-hmm. okay, I've, you know, now the way insurance is going, we'll spare that conversation, but you may get less than 14 days. So maybe the whole time yeah. that someone gets therapy, they're by themselves. Like how, how terrible mm-hmm. is that? And yeah. that's the whole point of coming down to the gym and, I know, you know, it, but have, half their therapy is just interacting with other people and getting oh, going, you know. Half so, their therapy is watching us act like ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, They're like, what are you? They just watch us like, right. y'all are right. so entertaining. Right. So um, that's, that's, but we're just being normal. They just think we're weird. Right. <laughs> that's obviously they're <laughs> the weird ones. Obviously. Yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, so I mean, it's like, I wonder about that. Like, is the precautionary two week isolation going to be a sticking point for years to come? Mm-hmm. I pray it isn't, but I, yeah. you know, we'll just wait and see. So, um, just to build on that really quick, cause it's talking about things that we want people to realize. So the two week isolation thing. Um, so when people come in from the hospital into a rehab setting or a nursing home setting, they have to be put on isolation or quarantine for 14 days, which means you're in a room, Anybody that has contact with you has to be staff on that hallway. Um, So you get to see, let's say, five people a day that are staffed at the nursing home. And you have to be gowned, gloved, masked, face shield, all of those things. So anybody you see looks like this coming in. They can barely hear you. And that's for 14 days. And it is so hard to watch people that are completely cognitively aware. So they're just as aware as you and I are to watch them sit in four walls for 14 days Mm -hmm. is depressing. Mm -hmm. Um, And they all talk about how depressing it is. And that's Mm -hmm. enough to make people go crazy. We just weren't meant to be isolated like that. And to be treated like you have a disease that you don't have, it just, it's really sad. Um, But anyway, just to kind of bring that to people's point of view, because again, this is just kind of talking about things people may not be aware of, may not even see. Okay, going back to y'all, tell me how COVID has affected, we've kind of talked about work life, how's COVID affected family and life balance? So like, you've talked about worried about germs, I guess, even if they don't know that they're worried about germs, but how's it affected, um, I'll give an example for me, when I come home after eight hours of being double gown, double gloved, mask all day, screaming all day. I've had people have to kind of put me in line and say, oh, like you're just tired, you're worn out, you don't feel like talking to anybody, your irritability, like your your rope is this long, you know. Uh, so for me, that's been a huge adjustment just to be like, okay, I need to reset when I get home because it's just way different. It's a, it's a lot more of a load at work that I need to not bring home. But what about you guys, like being a couple and being family? And I know for walk in the door, 
Hey, is always what he does. No. And it's like one of the best parts of my day, you know, because it, anyway, it's just after work, the best part. And for months sure. now we've said, don't touch daddy. He has to go take a shower. Mm-hmm. And so to see, or if I get him first, which I often do, and then Megan comes home later because she works harder than I do. She, <laughs> she, she she'll come in <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I'll say, no, 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 don't touch mommy. And he's running full speed. Don't touch her. And she's like, I, you know, hands up. It's like, don't touch me. I have to go take a shower. So they, he gets it now. I mean, he, he's older. He understands. And like I said, we've been doing this for a year, but at first it was just so hard to watch him not understand why can I not hug my mommy or my daddy, you know, when they're first sure. thing. Um, so I think from a kid perspective, that was the hardest thing for me from a, from a couple perspective, it like exactly echoing what you said, exactly the same thing, man, you come home. I know for us, we've been wearing uh, sometimes every single, I think out of eight or nine people we had seven or eight were on isolation. So every single yeah. person you're wearing stuff all day long, you've got a headache, you're hurting, you're exhausted, your voice hurts, you come in and then sadly you end up taking that out on the people closest to you, mm-hmm. which is so backwards of how it should be, but that's just, you know, how it works. So, so it's been hard like that. We have to realize like, man, I've had a, I've had a terrible day today. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to deal sure. with it. I just want to move on. Whereas if she's had a hard day, she wants to tell me about it. And, you know, we, it seems like we kind of alternate who had a good day, who had a bad day. And then yeah. if it's like, okay, I had the rough day. It's like, okay, I'm going to tag dishes. I'm going to do kit, you know, try mm-hmm. to take the burden off the other one. Cause they're probably dealing with some stuff that we'll figure out in a few hours once everybody goes to sleep and we can sit down and actually yeah. talk. But mm-hmm. um, I think that it's just been that uh, bringing that extra stress home on top of a typical work day, but then adding all that stuff in, it just seems like it, it takes me a little while longer to unwind once I'm home and try not to take that out on her or the mm-hmm. kids more, which is, it's hard to admit, but it, it true, you know, facts are facts. It's just sure. what happens. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I'll jump in with, with Antoinette being on here. She's actually one of the therapists that works with her, with us. So I was working at their building and Kane, I've told you this, but Megan, we've not chatted about this. So this was just like a couple of weeks ago. I went to help this building that needed help, um, got there early in the morning and, you know, they're walking in um, different therapists at different times and they come in and they just. Anymore. I, this isn't how I'm supposed to live. This is, I'm just stuck in this gown, stuck inside, blah, blah, blah. And they all started talking about inventing. They're all married with kids as well. Um, Men and women talking about how when they go. And and you don't even notice it because you just bring home all this pent up. I don't even. Feelings that you bring home and you don't realize that it's affected your family as much as it does until somebody calls you out on it, really. Right. Um, and so I had like this huge aha moment of, God, that's me. You know, <laughs> like I needed somebody to flick my nose and tell me, hey, stop griping, leave it at work. We're all dealing with it. But like for you guys, Megan, do you feel like there's been more t- you've kind of figured out a groove do you feel like at the beginning there was more tension between you guys and how did y'all work through that I think we did really good in the beginning um we were giving each other a lot more grace just because um it was just so new you know I think it's been harder in recent months just because we're so tired (laughs) um and yeah sure I think, well, and and plus, you know, we um, have an infant who right now isn't sleeping very well. So um, we're just like, I don't know. Bless y'all. I don't know how you're doing it. (laughs) We we don't either. Um, Y'all have got your eyelids taped up right now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But that's what I was, how I was going to answer your question is that I think for us, one of the hardest things right now is that all the different things that we used to use as like an outlet um, when we were really stressed out or um, when we just needed to kind of escape for a little bit, we can't do, Um, you know, for a long time, we, we went to church for the first time at Christmas, you know, so for nine months, we didn't go to church, which is very important to us. Um, Or like, we love to travel, you know, so we're not traveling. We didn't eat out in restaurants. We didn't, you know, and so it was just really difficult um, 
especially to try to have to explain that to your five-year-old. Um, hey, we can't go to hog wild pizza today, or we can't go and do this, or we can't go have this play date with this person. Um, you or know. see family. I mean, yeah, grandparent, my, yeah. our, my gra- I have a yeah. grandparent that lives here in Conway that he's very close to, and it's, we can't go, we don't want to get him sick, you know, so just like you said, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. And I think now that, that said, we've both been vaccinated, we're, yeah, yeah, like we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to do things, you know, um, we're still very, <laughs> very careful. Like we're wearing masks, we're socially distant, you know, all that. Um, we have to almost remind ourselves, okay, we have these children who have not been vaccinated. Like this is still very um, real, you know, for all of us, but especially for them, because um, they haven't had it and they haven't had the vaccine. So um, we just can't have those outlets that we used to have. So we've had to be a little bit more creative in how we are coping. Um, and like I said, we did really good at that in the beginning, but now it's yeah. just, it's getting difficult just because well, we're so tired. And winter, winter was hard too. I mean, cause in the yeah. summer when it was nice, we could, we did family bike rides, uh, for a long time. We did walk, you know, that kind of stuff. So winter made that harder too. And then, um, you know, just having to be inside more kid, you know, the kiddos want to burn yeah. energy and it's hard to do that inside. They start going blah, whenever they have to be inside too much. So, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. so yeah, so adding, adding that into the mix too. Yeah. That's a good one, Megan. I didn't even think about that. Like taking away kind of coping strategies that you're used to. So then you got to work with that as well. And hearing you mm-hmm. say that, I remember Kane talking about kind of like dad kid dates that you guys would go on or mom kid dates that you were going on and now you can't really do that either so that's that's super hard to kind of figure out how to mold and get a new routine I guess uh yeah I hadn't thought about that that's a that's a good thing to think about Mm -hmm. so with that you know having to change everything having these extra stressors at home from work and both of you being in healthcare. Uh, Megan working much harder than Kane, but that's beside the point. How has it affected your mental, physical, emotional health with balancing everything? So we've t- kind of talked about the stresses at work, your coping mechanisms. You've kind of had to change and rearrange and figure new things out. So physically, mentally, emotionally, how do you feel like it's kind of taken a toll on both of you guys? You want to go first? Um, sure. The thing was echoing in my headphones a little bit. So I think, I I think I heard the question. Um, I think mentally for me, it emotionally speaking, it's hard. Like we touched on earlier, it's hard to see these old people who I feel like God has called me to serve, call me to work for and called me into the setting. It's hard to see them suffering and a lot I mean I can think of a lady who I'm I'm convinced she died thinking her family had abandoned her and she died because she was so sad but she and I'm pretty sure you know who I'm talking about but um she did not understand why her family could not come visit her why they hadn't been up there to see her why they hadn't done all these things even though they've been in the window she didn't understand why they weren't physically inside and she died and I'm I'm convinced and I know it's because it was a broken heart and yeah so for me emotionally having to watch that and watch these people who I mean I've been there for over five years so these people I've come to know and trust and uh, be friends with and some of them come to love them quite honestly um having to watch them go through that or showing up to work on a Monday. And my first question to some of our good nurse friends is who all passed away this weekend, you know, and then they, they list three or four people and you're just like, Oh my gosh, that was one of my favorite ones, you know? Um, yeah. And then it's like, okay, so what am I going to do now? Well, what do you find out what happens? What do you do when one of your friends dies? You just keep going to work. Like it just, so it's like, you don't even have time to process that because mm-hmm. you just keep going. So Um, I think emotionally, that's just the hardest thing is when you realize that, man, these people are really, I think last I'd heard like 25% of the people that lived in our nursing home ended up passing away. You realize this is a vulnerable population and that these are people that we know and love. And then one day they're there and then the next day they're not. And so then having to just know that and not even get a chance to process it, but just keep having to go to work every day. And then that happens every every day, every few days, every, you know, who did, who, who passed away yesterday, because, you know, you just, you want to know, because you're worried about them, but yeah. at the same time, you don't, I don't even want to ask, you know, so 
Um, I think emotionally that's been the hardest part for me is just having to keep going like nothing ever happened when you don't even kind of have a chance to grieve these people um, and be, I mean, you're sad about it later. I still think about them, but it's like, okay, I I just take five seconds and say a prayer for them and thank God, ask to ask God to be with them and their family and then just keep going, you know? So I think that for me, emotionally, that's been the, the hardest part. Yeah. Megan, what about you? Um, well, and I don't see nearly what you guys see just because, you know, generally speaking, my patient population is, um, much younger, much healthier. So, um, it hasn't been to that degree. And again, most people who come in, it's, it's, well, everyone is on an outpatient basis. So you're screened right when you come into the clinic. And if you of course have any symptoms or have had any exposure, you're not coming in. So I'm not seeing, you know, what you guys are seeing. Um, but I am seeing people who have had it, who have had family members who have had it, who have no people or who, um, have been affected, you know, with deaths in the family. And, um, so I'm hearing all of that. Um, but I think on a personal level, um, you know, I was six weeks pregnant when the first case came to Arkansas and we have a history of multiple miscarriages. Um, and so I was extremely anxious when all this first started, um, just because it wasn't for me, it's kind of hard to explain, but anybody who's had babies, they'll, they'll get it. But, um, it wasn't for me, but it was just for this human that my body was hosting. You know, I was, I was terrified that I was going to do something to get this disease. And then I didn't know how it was going to affect my baby. Um, and so I was extremely, extremely anxious in the first trimester because that's when we really didn't know a lot about it. Um, yeah. And so I actually ended up doing telemedicine for a month from home, um, just because I knew, I just needed to to step away. I mean, I needed to be at home for a month. Um, and so I think for me, it was knowing my limits, knowing, um, that I couldn't keep going the way that I was. And so I went and talked to my doctor about it and we had a conversation and, um, the decision was made for me to stay at home and do telehealth. Um, and so now that I'm seeing pregnant patients, um, or just patients in general going through the same thing or having the same anxiety um, or depression, um, mental health problems. It's just, it's really difficult for me because I know what that's like. um, And I'm treating anxiety and depression at um, a much, much higher rate than I normally would. Um, And so it it just really affects you um, not only to see that, but I mean, I've walked in those footsteps, you know, and I know how hard that is. So um, yeah, it's just heavy heavy stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I I actually remember that now that you say it, it triggers. I remember talking as when you were going through that and props to you, Megan, for being so aware of your body and your needs. Cause I feel like myself included, sometimes you just kind of push it to the side and push to the side and you keep doing what you feel like you need to do. But in return, you're just doing yourself a disservice, you know? all need to take our mental physical emotional health much more serious than we do now you know um i Mm -hmm. i know for myself work balancing work and life has been i got the word that comes to my head is like excruciating in the last year because i feel like i'm super going and doing and i do music all the time and that kind of came to a halting stop and like you said your coping mechanisms were taken away So all your friends, your family, I can't go do music and work has taken on this whole new perspective and like all these new responsibilities that are just overwhelming. And like Kane said, I think Kane, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we came back after a week or two, uh, not even being allowed in our building because it was so infested with COVID. When they finally let us in, they like gave us a list and I'm talking man, it was like 20, 30 names. It was just overwhelming reading all these names and watching the nurses who we hadn't seen in a week, maybe two weeks. They lost a ton of weight. They, they looked tired. They had bags under their eyes. They were crying under their mask. I know one of them fell apart when we talked because just like Kane said, they watched 20, 30, 40 people die in just a few days. And it's like, well, call the coroner, get them in a bag, send them out, but keep going, continue gowning and ungowning and gowning and it's just so much to take in. 
So I feel like it's super important, just like Megan, to be aware of yourself, your needs, and to address them. So I'm super proud of you for being like, hey, this is what I need to do. Even though I'm sure you struggled with, I uh, probably need to be aware, oh, I need to do this. In the grand scheme, that's not what matters. Your health and your happiness. And guess what? It worked out fine. Probably for the better, honestly, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm proud of you for that. Not many people do that. That's awesome. Um, so going from that, what kind of re-energizes you too? So you come home from these work jobs, you've got kids, family, dogs, all this mess running around. What do you two do individually to kind of re-energize, kind of boost yourself back up? I think for me, the biggest thing, you know, like we've talked about, we're, we're big into um, church. Um, and so for me, music and like worship music is yeah. really important. I mean, that can just instantly mm -hmm. change my mood. Um, so if I've had a really bad day, I'll just come, come in and we'll have a um, worship session. Um, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really important to me. Um, let's see. I think trying my best to unplug, leave my day at the door and just focus on Kane and our kids um, is really important um, because like I said, we don't have those outlets anymore. You know, we can't um, go and do the social gatherings and um, go out and travel like we used to. Um, and so just trying to really focus on what we have um, and be yeah. thankful for those things. Um, I would like to say it's working out, but I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> so maybe one of these days. <laughs> I, um, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Working out was walking from my living room into here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Work out. Kane, what do you do to re-energize? Oh, uh, kind of the same thing. I think trying to, trying to go from an, we go going and doing stuff, going to visit family, friends. Uh, like we would go to hog wild on a Thursday just because, you know, our kiddo loved it, you know, just doing that. I would, I would say our biggest, we kind of re-energized by going from looking outward to kind of looking inward and looking outside the home to looking inside. What are we, you know, making our home a safe space? Um, our son colored a, a happy face and put it on the door so that Aww. on the garage door so that <laughs> it's like a, a reminder of when we walk through the door, the world stays out there and our yeah. family happens in here mm -hmm. and, and we do that. But um, for me, I love to, uh, hunt. I love to be outdoors. We like to do that. So I've been able to get away and do a lot of that this past year. We've been uh, kind of getting into that. My son's getting into that for the first time. So that's been a lot of fun. That's been, it's been nice, especially mm -hmm. because I don't know, you can relate to this, but when you have to work now more than ever in such a sterile environment where everything yeah. has to be clean and everything, you can't bring a single germ in or we're a germ, the nicest thing to do is get out in nature and feel like mm -hmm. you're, you know, when your walls are closing in, the best thing you can do and get outside them you know um i think you mean so we love to get outside. the walls I, okay if you, did, if, you oh. if you didn't plug it i was going to you know what i'm saying i was gonna, I was gonna throw it out that's a song i wrote uh, for everybody that has no idea who i am go ahead <laughs> right so for those of you uh newbies should we say to newbies. towns and theme music so uh but yeah so i think for me that's that's what i kind of like to do is just get outside uh playing golf playing sports uh in the street with the kids or uh, just getting out and hunting doing that kind of stuff that kind of recharges my batteries just because mm -hmm. yeah. I, it just had like a revelation of man we have to work in such a sterile environment and like you mm -hmm. said we we weren't called to do that god made us to be in the world not in a building you know so yeah um so yeah. so being able to get out and do that really kind of recharges my batteries yeah i think there's some days when the sun's shining and we can see it in the window kane and i stand at the window and we're like <laughs> like through oh. our 17 layers it it gets claustrophobic honestly and sure, he's yeah. he and i've had that talk before of just like mirroring what you said we weren't born to be this way this is not how we were meant to be and so it's so hard for me to kind of regather that thought of i'm meant to be with these geriatrics like i love them i love loving them but you put all these barriers in between us and it's so hard to do what you're called to do right. because now you have to love them basically through a bubble and then dealing with being claustrophobic and hot and just being outside, getting some dirt under your fingers. 
to do a world of good for for me as well so i'd have to agree with both of y'all on that mm -hmm. um with that all right so we're kind of we're kind of getting to the end of it what advice people especially married or with kids as far as being able to find peace and balance during these crazy times my my advice would be honestly especially relationship here but if you're not married or you know best friend whatever just communicate with people because being upfront and honest there are times when i've come in and i've said i i just need i don't need kids i don't need the dog i do i need me i need my headphones i just need to relax a little bit something so i think for me the biggest thing would be communication to whoever you have um because if you let that stuff build up or if you don't get it out or have a, an outlet or something then it it just kind of gets really hard to get outside of your own mind mm -hmm. um, even today and something that just you just have to be honest with each other mm -hmm. and just say like hey I, like you said earlier someone called you out you have to just be like hey this i'm seeing this is are you okay you're kind of being a biatch is yeah. it yeah <laughs> she, she looked at me she said you're kind of being a biatch you know <laughs> God, it. Um, yeah but it's just like being, being, being able to have that trust, trusted person that you can communicate with and just be like, Hey, I'm not okay. Like I'm no, I'm not okay yeah. right now and to me. The communication that mm -hmm. goes for so many different things in life, but especially this with how you're feeling, where you're at mentally mm -hmm. being able to somebody about that and be honest. And, and then once you get that out, you feel so much better. You don't have yeah. to hold it in anymore. And you, uh, you know, like for the two of us, she's walking, we're walking side by side. She's able to help me, help carry that burden for me and help me move yeah. away from it into a better space. So. Yeah. Megan, what about you? What do you see a good tip or strategy that you would give somebody to deal with all of this going on? Um, I agree with Kane. I think knowing your own limits is so important. I mean, obviously I already said that at the beginning of all this, I went to my doctor and said, I can't do this right now. My six week fetus, I've, yeah. I've got to stay home. Um, so I think just knowing your limits and respecting those, but then also I think on the flip side of what I was saying, it's really important to be receptive to when people come to you and say, yeah. are you okay? Or it's not actually, or, um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing these and, um, it's alarming for me. Um, cause we, and we do that to each other all the time. Um, and I think just being receptive to that and knowing, Hey, the people closest to me and who love me the most are seeing things in me that aren't helping. And then yeah. kind of taking a step back and doing whatever you've got to do to um, address those. Um, and whether that is just taking a minute and going and listening to some dubstep, then that's fine. Go and do it. Um, or if that is professional help and going to see a counselor, getting medicated, um, going for a run, whatever it is, um, but just do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's no shame in all of this. And I just think you can give yourself enough love and support and grace in all of this right now. Um, and the same is true for your spouse and friends and just trying to be there for one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think grace is a really good word. We need to learn to give way more grace than we're used to giving because it's just a weird time. Yeah. Uh, I actually read, so being honest, I know y'all get these as well. You know, you get those medical catalogs and stuff in the mail. I usually just throw them away, but I opened this one actually talking about therapy one-on-one -on -one, and the title of it was No Reprieve from the Chaos and I actually posted it on my page because mm -hmm. I was in time thought, uh, this girl was in my mind and wrote this article. I mean, it related so much to what I see every day. And pretty much all it talked about was what we've all hit on. It's you've got to do the daily grind and then COVID hit and it's a different daily grind. And it's like 10 more jobs added to what you were doing before. And then not only the stresses of germs in your house, but in other people's houses, just all these things and being closed in, in a bubble, all these things that we were not designed to do, right? And especially right. alone, isolated. So it's like every disaster right now. And she was saying that she, how bad she was struggling mentally because she saw everybody else coming to work. It's a toxic environment because they just gripe, 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 gripe because nobody's mm. happy right now, right? She goes home by herself and it's just this deep, dark hole. So she was saying, 
uh, how important it is. She ended up going to counseling and just being like, I just need to talk about this and get it off my chest. And Megan, like you said, communicating, just talking to somebody about it, showing grace to yourself. Like I said, proud of you because just recognizing I am not okay. And I mean, statistics of all of this have skyrocketed for a reason. Like we were not, we weren't designed for all of this change and all of this isolation and you two have each other, but still, you still need to focus on yourself because if you're not your best self, you're not your best spouse, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. So I think, yeah, I think for me, this past year is just kind of figuring yourself out, grace and going from there, I guess. So yeah, like you said, reaching out, whether that be to a friend, to a counselor, to a doctor for medication, or just going for a jog, whatever helps you kind of recenter yourself and get ready for the day again. Yeah. What do you guys hope to see come from COVID? And we'll kind of break this up. Okay, so when this all kind of comes to an end, comes to a head, what do you guys hope to see come from all of this? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I think a couple things. One, I hope that we've all learned not to take anything for granted. I know we kind of talked about this earlier, but, um, you know, our health, our access to health care, our friends, our spouses, partners, being able to gather, gather community at a potluck um go to concert yeah. yeah go to concert um go to a grocery store without worrying about somebody being right. super <laughs> yeah. you know, grab um, a loaf of bread without yes uh, toilet paper you know anything um i just think there's so many things that we've were previously taking for granted um that we've now realized that you shouldn't be um we just need to be thankful for all of those things um so here on out. I mean, I know that we are super thankful for all of those things and we'll never take them for granted. Um, but then also I think what's been really important for me to try to communicate with other people when talking about why we're doing the things that we're doing as far as wearing a mask or getting vaccinated or anything, it's being able to see beyond yourself. You know, um, obviously I didn't want to get COVID. Kane didn't want to get COVID. We didn't want to bring it home to our children, but it's so much bigger than that. You know, we don't want to get it because we didn't want to spread it to our patients or um, to the people who are too close to you in the checkout line. You know, um, it's just so important to realize how your actions or sometimes your inaction affects everyone around you um, mm -hmm. in your communities. And there's just this big domino effect. And so I think that this was a perfect example of that. Um, and sometimes you have to do things that you're uncomfortable with or that you don't want to do for the betterment of the masses. Um, so I hope we can come out of this respecting one another, being more kind to one another. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah Man, I totally too. agree with that. That would be. Oh, go ahead. You're good. You go ahead. Oh, no, uh, I was, I, I was I totally just saying that's a great I, one. I think, I think yeah, no, I, I, I think the exact same thing. I think the fact that oh man, I, we have such a unique perspective getting to deal with people who are 70, 80, 90, 108 years old is the oldest lady I've ever treated. Like literally was getting therapy. Um, I could pick her up with my pinky. Pinky but that's or, or see, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but just, just hearing the stories from these guys and then it's so weird. It's like you have one one foot in that world. And then I turn around and I see people our age and people even older than us or younger than us, whatever. I just feel like we're such a selfish uh, nation now. Like mm -hmm. it, it's all about me. What am I going to do? What am I? What what do I deserve? What should be coming to me type of a different thing? And I just feel like. I hope coming from this, we realize that we're all in this uh country together and there's a lot of other people like you said that depend on are affected by the actions that i take every day so i wish we could see a little more selflessness instead mm -hmm. of selfishness and to me that just boils down to the word citizenship just being a good citizen caring for and it's just a christian principle too that's right America. <laughs> uh, <Barca. laughs> 
everybody always gives me a hard time because I love America, but I do. It's the best. Um, we should. Right. <laughs> but um, just being able to, to realize that a lot of it and just like a Christian principle, like serving other people, putting other people's needs mm -hmm. before your own, putting other people's well-being before your comforts, you know, just different things like that. So I, I hope that has kind of uh, my self included opened my eyes and realized that, man, what I. Yeah, I do feel like my. Um what would I say? People, selfish people, like my patience with them has run really short during right. COVID. Uh, for example, like insurance and companies don't push me because I'm already doing all of this. And I feel like every day is a huge step into as a therapist and as a healthcare worker, every day I step into that building and try to be selfless. And you have to give everything because again, this isn't how we were meant to be. So you're stepping in knowing you're gonna do all these things that are terrible, but every day I step in and I tell myself, even if I don't wanna do this, the, I might be the only person that makes this person's day. Sure. And so I go in, I try to put on a smile and make their day the best day that they've had. And so when insurance calls me or a company calls me pushing me, I think that's where the selfishness has really triggered me for sure in the last year. Um, I feel like I haven't, there's just no room for people to be selfish right now. And like you said, Megan, showing grace for everybody. And I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like my heart has grown bigger and fonder for like my therapy team. Like I will go down for you. Mm -hmm. Might have close come close a few times already, but like, <laughs> I just see the struggle that's happening mm -hmm. and you're not going to see it unless you're in it. And I will go down for people. And I feel like, like you said, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but grace was just such a great word. I know I'm going to stick with that because people that aren't showing it right now, there's just no time for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We got enough stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Last thing. And then we'll be done. I do want to say thanks so much for hopping on with me. It has been awesome. You guys had a fantastic turnout. I don't know if you can see all these people commenting and there have been lots of compliments for you guys. So thanks so much for hopping on. Last thing, what do you feel like this has taught you guys? So maybe for as a married couple, what do you feel like COVID, the pandemic, all of these struggles, what do you feel like it's taught? What are you going to take away in summary what would you say? You go. Okay. Um, again, I think it just goes back to what's most important. Um, and I think, I mean, I feel like I'm echoing myself, but our health, our family, yeah. um, just not taking anything for granted. Yeah. Um, we've, proven that in the past year, um, we can go without some of the luxuries that we were um, accustomed to, um, going out to eat, going to the movies. Oh, we haven't been to the movies in a year. Concerts, yeah. you know, in, anything Concerts, yeah. um, oh, that we were, that we used to love, um, we've gone without. And um, I think just realizing like what is most important um, and just really trying to focus on that and be protective of that. Cause like we said, when we are super stressed out or anxious, the easiest thing to do is to come home and take it out on the people who are most important to you. Um, so just trying to keep the focus on, they are the most important, this is the most important. Um, why are we doing the things that we're doing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, would, I would completely echo that sentiment that it, it really brought to the forefront what our priorities are. Um, not that they weren't always there, but it's so easy to sure. have them be clouded by the busyness of life. And we got two kids. We, I work one to th three jobs, depending on what season of life we're in. Um, yeah. You know, we've got hobbies, we've got things, um, trips, like she said, stuff. But I feel like when you boil, when you take all that down and take all that away, it boils down to what really matters in life. And that's your family. Uh, for us, it's our faith first and then our, our family and then our friends. And, um, 
unfortunately the we weren't able to go to church we weren't able to see our friends and family as much so it was really just like we we had so many good um quality times here at home doing things that i never we never would have done had we Mm -hmm. not had all those other things stripped away so i think uh, just having a, a good year long reminder that yeah 2020 was really hard but at our church uh when we we first got back one of the first messages i heard was man everyone's going to talk about how bad 2020 was it stunk it was terrible and but you can really see the hand of god moving in a lot of different things and especially in our family like all the quality time we had all the the memories we made all the i mean we had our our second child was born um so just some different things that i i wouldn't have otherwise been made aware of had COVID and the pandemic not been here. We should have carried on life as general, running the rat race kind of every day, going down at night before, okay, what do we have to do tomorrow? Just knocking off the checklist as opposed to being able to sit back and really take inventory and take stock of what matters and make some good memories with our family and um, being able to spend time with those people that really mean the most to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I am. Um... There's been, 2020 was a crazy year, but kind of like you said, some of the best things that have happened, especially for my music, happened during that little lag of time, you know, and I know I came to work just being like, it's almost like 2020, as terrible as it was for us busy, spoiled Americans, it almost taught us how to slow down and, hey, you don't have to do all these things and stress yourself out because I know, Kane, you and I got to where, especially for me, there were months I was working like two hours and that's just all I had at work. And your first thought is to freak out and stress out, but somehow everything worked, everything came together. My bills still got paid. I still got to go to this. And I met all these amazing opportunities through music. And in like two months, I got like 30,000 followers. I got all these endorsers, like a label, like what in 2020 during COVID. And so I just feel like, kind of like you guys, I feel like it's taught us to slow down and really figure out what matters in life and what you should, do you really need to be grinding as hard as we were in 2019? No, right. no, you don't. Cause it all still works out just fine when you focus on family and you focus on your passion. And so. Thanks for having us Steve. <laughs> Bye, Bye y'all, absolutely. Selena with Impact Coaching and Consulting is a certified life coach who helps women find harmony with their faith, family, and career. She offers a virtual goals workshop, mastermind group, and a one-on-one private coaching where she helps you identify your deepest purpose, develop a roadmap to reach tangible goals, and encourage you to overcome any obstacles along the way. Selena's worked with hundreds of business professionals throughout the United States including small business owners, direct sales associates, chiropractors, financial advisors, real estate agents, doctors, professors, teachers, and many more. You can follow her at coach underscore Selena on Instagram and Impact Life Coaching on Facebook. You'll love the encouragement and the practical tips for finding harmony in your unique life. If you're looking for the best way to keep up with everything that's going on in the Conway, Arkansas area, Conway Scene is the perfect place to go. They're a digital-only platform that tells stories of coffee, culture, and commerce in the Conway area. They believe in telling the stories of those who make their community a better place. They also have a robust calendar with many events each month and a new business directory. You can visit them at www. ConwayScene.com to learn more. If you're looking to buy or sell, I have the perfect realty company for you. Clark & Co. Realty is located in the Benton, Bryant, Arkansas area. And they understand that buying or selling a home is more than just a transaction. It's a life-changing experience. That's why their team of highly seasoned real estate professionals is dedicated to providing exceptional, personalized services for all their clients. They truly take great pride in the relationships they build, and they always work relentlessly on the client's behalf to help them achieve their perfect real estate goals. They always have the client in mind, and I can speak firsthand when I say how reliable, trustworthy, and quick 
they were. When I was looking to buy my first home, they were there with me every step of the way, answering every question I could think of. They showed me a great amount of knowledge and patience through the process. It's no wonder they've won so many awards for their outstanding services and their excellent relationships with clients. So if you're looking to buy or sell, there is no better option than Clark & Co Realty. If you enjoyed this conversation and are interested in becoming a sponsor, feel free to shoot me an email at townsendtmusic at hotmail.com or shoot me a message on any social media platform at Townsend Team Music for more information. I would love for you to become a member to help spread awareness that you're not alone.